The second march to Parliament in as many days, calling for South Africa to sever ties with Israel. Protesters say South Africa cannot just pay lip service in condemning violence against Palestine, given the anti-apartheid struggle in this country. The people that are under occupation and that are suffering this are not only Muslim. There are Muslims and Christians that are all suffering under the Zionist occupation. Let me say this. They tried to create the promised land. They didn't succeed since 1967. They didn't succeed. Various political parties have voiced their support for Palestine and its people. South Africa has lived through what we're seeing in uh, Palestine or East Jerusalem, we're seeing on a daily basis, is um, reminiscent of the history of South Africa. And if South Africans cannot recognize those atrocities as the human rights violations that they are, then, then, uh, then I'm astounded. So many international agreements have been entered into, and Israel has not complied with a single one of those agreements. And all the Palestinian people are asking for is to live with dignity in the land which rightfully belongs. It is time the South African government acts on its promise to downgrade the embassy of Israel. The ANC took that resolution in 2017 and we are saying as young people that we want it implemented and if they do not implement it as government, as young people and as people who pledge solidarity with the people of Palestine, we must go and do it ourselves. The words of former President Nelson Mandela that South Africa cannot be completely free until Palestine is free have again been repeated and invoked during today's march. We want our government to hear the call of its people because we are speaking as South Africans today and we are saying to our government we do not want a downgrade of an embassy in Israel. We want to totally shut down our embassy in Tel Aviv in particular and we must fully reinstate and support our embassy in Ramallah, Palestine, to show where we stand in the Palestinian issue. We want to say to our government here on our shores that we can never anymore tolerate traffic rights that are being granted to El Ar, which is a national carrier of the Israeli apartheid regime that comes daily onto our shores at OR Tambo International. The South African Zionist Federation has meanwhile rejected calls for the State of Israel to be sanctioned. It says boycotts are coercive and anti-democratic and will not provide a way forward for the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. Boycotts would never work. Israel has an economy larger than South Africa, has very high levels of foreign direct investment and has innovations that are used every single day in South Africa and around the world. And thirdly, boycotts cannot work in terms of a two-state solution. The Israelis and the Palestinians need to come together to work out a solution to this conflict, and boycotts can never provide that. The South African Jewish Board and the South African Zionist Federation says condemning and demonizing Israel is irresponsible, inflammatory and dangerous. Pro-Palestinian supporters across all political and religious formations are expected to use the International Mandela Day in July to travel to rally support for Palestine. Vanessa Puna, SABC News, Cape Town. Well, to discuss this uh, story a little further, we've uh, invited Professor Farid Isaac uh, uh, from the Africa for Palestine to uh, join us via Zoom. Uh, Prof, thanks very much indeed for joining us and welcome to the program. It's a pleasure and thank you very much for having me, Peter. All right. So two uh, significant days of uh, protest uh, and turnout for uh, pro-Palestinian uh, uh, movements. Uh, my question to you is the demands being made on the South African government uh, to deal with Israel, how much can they actually do? Well, the one is what it can actually do in terms of concrete uh, reality, in terms of actually uh, transforming uh, things. Um, and so that is, uh, that is a matter for debate. Um, uh, I've heard the uh, spokesperson from the uh, Zionist Federation saying that uh, Israeli trade is much larger than South Africa's. And uh, Israel is much less dependent on uh, international uh, trade uh, than what uh, South Africa uh, is. 
And South Africa is a bit of a cheat to be calling for that. So <clears throat> in tangible terms, um, that still has to be uh, calculated. But the damage that will be inflicted on Israel when a democracy with the pedigree and the background of South Africa and the historical consciousness that still resonates in the imagination of the international community about the nature of this country, the kind of conflict that we face and the kind of resistance that we offered uh, to that uh, uh, years of oppression against apartheid and how we actually overcame it. South Africa enjoys a moral standing in the world equivalent to none. And it is in their way in our strength lies, this punching above our weight. And so it's not so much in terms of economic terms and economic figures. And South Africa, uh, Israel is really, I mean, an inconsequential partner for South Africa, um, an inconsequential economic partner for South Africa. As for all of these inventions that Israel keeps on touting that it has invented this and that and Intel and the chips inside your telephone and and, and. apartheid South Africa <clears throat> invented the world's first heart transplant. Apartheid South Africa invented the first brain cat scans. Apartheid South Africa invented ATM, this money machine that we pull from the bank, from a range of things to creepy crawlies that wash, uh, that cleans our swimming pools. Apartheid South Africa was the first country in the world to draw oil from coal. And so economic achievement and making um, uh, uh, huge things about that, the Nazis were in the forefront of technology and, uh, and civilizational development. <clears throat> so that says nothing about your real worth in human terms to the world. And so South Africa must move, not because it is able to impact on Israel economically, but it has a moral obligation to do so, and the country can mm-hmm. economically afford to do so. Um, <clears throat> cutting economic ties with Israel is not going to cost the South African economy seriously. Our economy is much larger than that. We've got far more, far many others, uh, any other, far many other partners in the world. Of course, there would be the pressure that this country would face uh, from the United States. And that is something that we had successfully negotiated uh, under Trump's regime. And there is no way, uh, there is, uh, uh, I can't see why we should not be able to navigate that uh, under uh, Biden's administration. So we've seen two intifadas uh, in uh, uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, in previous years. Is there something different about this moment, even though we have not quite reached the point of full-scale war. Some people might say it feels like war already, but is there something different about this moment in time? And I'm asking because, because of things like social media, this has never been so visible to the whole world as it is at this time. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, Peter. Social media is escalating the amount of awareness and you can no longer deny the barbarity of your crimes of occupation. Um, But the point is for social media to reach the level uh, that governments actually act. I mean, one sees, for example, that a larger percent of the Democrats Uh, in the United States, um, or more than 30% of the Democrats actually support the the boycott and divestment uh, movement against uh, Israel. Um, And a majority of Democrats feel that uh, Israel is actually an impediment to the security of the United States. And at the same time, this doesn't get the the old stalwarts, uh, the power bases or the powerhouses of the Democrats in the U.S. to actually move. So it takes a long time. I mean, the ANC had uh, three years ago adopted this resolution. Fine, it withdrew the ambassador from Tel Aviv. It did not send the ambassador back to Tel Aviv. But formally, there has been no notice 
of this uh, downgrade. Um, <clears throat> so there is still much uh, that has to be done. And um, the fact that uh, social media is there, that does create a serious difference. But on the other hand, if truth be told, um, we are sitting with an Arab neighborhood, um, despite the uh, diplomatic language with which uh, Her Excellency, uh, the ambassador um, to South Africa, had couched it in. We are sitting in a neighborhood that comprises of a deeply divided uh, a, a division between the citizenry and uh, the rulers of uh, those countries. And um, during earlier intifadas, they could expect support from the media, at least in those countries, and verbal support, at least, from uh, the leaders of uh, those countries. And this is not uh, the case this time. Although if there were an intifada to seriously develop in Side, um, inside Palestine, I dare say that civil society, whatever is left of it, in those Arab countries, in the Gulf states, for example, and in Egypt, it may reach a level of discontent with their own governments um, that the effects of this will be uncontainable for those uh, leaderships. Talk to me a little bit about um, how the region might be affected by this current uh, uh, escalation in violence. Are we going to see conversations taking place and maybe shifts in, in uh, thought? Um, <clears throat> I don't think that shifts in thought <clears throat> occurs that easily amongst um, the leaders of these states. Um, they are there to protect their families and their wealth and their statuses and positions in their societies. Um, so I don't foresee, I mean, an, any ideological shift or shift of thought. Uh, what I do see is a deeper frustration growing amongst the populace and the activists in those countries to the extent at which activism is allowed, say, in a country like Saudi uh, Arabia or the United Arab uh, Emirates. I do see an escalation of that, and that could begin to force some of the more enlightened people among the ruling class to begin to see that, um, that this foreign uh, uh, imposition in the Middle East is no longer viable as a foreign imposition um, and that this ongoing uh, trekking from, uh, from other people in other parts of the world who have no historical relationship, and I'm not talking about a promise uh, that a God made to a particular group of people. I'm not talking about that historical in that sense. And here people who have lived in that place for centuries already, they still have keys of the houses that they left 70 years ago. <clears throat> um, so I, I do think um, that there will be a shift in the consciousness of um, the Arabs uh, inside um, in that part of the world. Um, and how this shift impacts on the leadership uh, in that countries and, uh, say, the tensions inside the royal family, for example, in, um, in, the, U in the Emirates or in uh, Saudi Arabia, that is a long shot uh, to be um, speculating about uh, at this stage. One key international player, the United States. Joe Biden has got the biggest headache at the moment. He probably did not anticipate that things would escalate so quickly, given the issues that he's facing at home, even though there was always the potential. The question must be for him, as he struggles at the Security Council, might his project of a new America, a new uh, um, internationally facing America, uh, might it face some serious headwinds over this uh, 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 Israeli-Palestinian question right now? Um, I don't think so. <clears throat> the reality is that the Republican Party uh, is a serious opposition, yes. Um, the, uh, the parliamentary uh, or the uh, House of Representatives and in the Senate, I mean, the numbers aren't kind of really too secure for Biden to move uh, in a serious way. But above all, 
the influence of the Zionist lobby in the United States, it remains a formidable lobby. And so it's not so much that his agenda uh, will have to be reframed, but it is Willie and many American presidents, including Republicans such as Nixon uh, and even Kennedy, had spoken about this uh, sometimes off the record or after um, the uh, after the, uh, the 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 secrecy uh, the things had expired on their things. It was quite clear that many many of those presidents um, they were never really. Uh, in tandem with the demands of Israel, but they were forced to by the strength of the lobbies. And so I don't think that there's going to be any significant change in how the lobbies operate. But what I do know is that the Zionist lobbies and the bastions of those lobbies in the United States, they are being contested at the moment by emerging young Jewish uh, organization from J Street to Jewish Voices for Peace, and the vast majority of younger American Jews no longer identify with Israel as an apartheid state. There's still an affinity towards Israel, but increasingly uh, the support is growing uh, that one must judge Israel by its human rights record um, and not by um, by stories of um, this dishonest uh, property agent who uh, gave us this piece of territory um, 2,000 years ago, and uh, the same agent went around and promised it somebody else, and now you expect, you know, uh, the whole world to just fall for your particular scripture and so on. So many, many young Jews, and it is those young Jews in the United States that's going to be changing the nature of politics because they are going to be inheriting the funds of many of those uh, lobbies, because it's, it's really rooted deeply inside families also. Um, and so I do see a ch- difference, yes, that's already happening inside the Democratic Party as well as outside the Democratic Party. Um, and uh, Israel is, I mean, it certainly can't take the Democrats for granted anymore. Mm-hmm. It, it's now, especially with Trump, still in control of the Republican Party. It certainly takes the Republican Party for granted. And um, to that extent, the demographics in the United States has changed. Israel's support has always been in the Democratic uh, Party and the Christian uh, religious right wing because of a deep anti-Semitism and a deep anti-Semitism. They never really supported Israel as a political entity. And that has shifted uh, under Trump so that the Republican Party is now uh, the party uh, of choice for uh, Zionist Israel and its supporters uh, throughout the world. But this it's very, very difficult with uh, ordinary Jews who are just sensible and think about other things such as Black Lives Matter, race and racism, gender equality. This kind of um, uh, seeing how Israel is connected to a right wing it leaves them deeply uncomfortable. And quite uh, frankly, I mean, uh, this kind of uh, disconnect, you know, between what they really believe in and what they see, this on the one hand, and on the other hand, the kind of propaganda that they are subjected to all the time and that they have to buy in the whoop of the, <clears throat> the Zionist Federation and the Jewish Board of Deputies. It's quite a vicious whoop. And um, they're destroying some of the best young Jewish minds in the way in which uh, they're going about uh, things. So as for a long-term shift, I don't know. But we in South Africa know that at a time when the apartheid regime was at its most vicious, it was actually a sign that it was crumbling. When it appeared that our own people in their thousands were going to jail and one state of emergency after another, it did signal the end. So it is just historically untenable um, that a regime and an occupation such as this kind, on the one hand, and on the other hand, meeting the kind of resistance that we see amongst Palestinian people, young people, elderly people, we're just the refusal to forget 
um, <clears throat> their refusal to uh, change their identity for another identity, uh, the Zionists are up against a formidable uh, enemy and an enemy that uh, is familiar with uh, the country and the terrain and the olive fields and so on. So uh, it is inevitable, I think, that at some stage, uh, like all of history moves towards generally a more progressive, along a, a more progressive uh, trajectory, this will also be the case. And uh, apartheid Israel, like apartheid South Africa, will end up in the dustbin of history. All right. Professor Farid Isak, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us. Uh, your insights, always greatly appreciated. Thank you. All right. That's uh, Professor Farid Isak, a professor in religious studies at the University of Johannesburg, talking to us uh, about the ongoing uh, escalating conflict between Israel and Palestine that's playing out at the moment. And earlier on, you heard from the uh, Palestinian ambassador to South Africa. Uh, just to let you know, this program has reached out to the Israeli embassy here in South Africa, but we haven't got a response. I'm hoping that this time tomorrow evening, I'll be talking to a member of the Knesset uh, to, from Israel to tell us a little bit about the Israeli view about the current conflict. So join us tomorrow evening uh, for that uh, interview.